Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome on behalf of the Learning and Development Working Group of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. My name is Michelle Van Aken, and I will be your host during this webinar. With funding from USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, Plan International is supporting the LD Working Group of the Alliance to develop capacity building resources for child protection actors to support adapting to COVID 19 realities. As part of this project, we conducted a capacity gaps assessment, and what came across clearly was the need for adaptations to life skills programming to be facilitated remotely and over online platforms. To, sh to share some learning on what approaches have worked well, we have put together a wonderful panel of presenters. First, we will be hearing from Brian e. Walsh working with DRC, sharing a case study from Lebanon. We will then have a joint presentation from Mace Silwan from Clowns Without Borders and Lisa Daspan from Plan International Nigeria, who will present together. Many thanks to our presenters for sharing these experiences. I now hand the uh, microphone over to Brian e. Thank you, Brian e. So today I'll be giving you an example from our child protection programming in Lebanon. Um, for a bit of context, COVID-19 was first recorded in Lebanon in February of 2020, and by March we were in total lockdown with movements greatly restricted. Uh, this of course impacted on our ability to reach persons of concern and for people to access our services uh, and on the ability to deliver almost all of our programming. Uh, the example I'll give today is only one element of the child protection programming and the humanitarian response that was adapted to respond to the new reality. Within DRC Lebanon, we have an integrated and holistic focused PSS package called the Empowering Adolescence Program. This program was originally adapted from the Women's Refugee Commission, the I Am Here package, which is an adolescent girls program. Uh, DRC, along with WRC, adapted this program for the Lebanese context back in 2014. Uh, and the program has been expanded over time to also focus on other protection risks facing adolescent girls and boys from refugee and host communities. The approach takes a whole of household and community approach to promoting a positive environment for adolescents to grow. The PSS toolkit aims to provide appropriate prevention and empowerment messaging to adolescents and their caregivers who are assessed to be at risk child labour or child marriage, which are widely recognised to be two of the main cross-cutting intersectoral concerns facing children in Lebanon. The sessions that run over three months consist of mandatory sessions around gender-based violence and child protection, how to access sexual and reproductive health services, legal awareness specific to the age groups, as well as a number of sessions that are delivered uh, specifically related to the needs of the group and can include a range of optional sessions such as stress management, communication skills, decision making skills, career counselling and others. The format for this programming in pre-COVID times was in a group of around 8 to 15 face to face in community centres or safe spaces. From March, like many of you I'm sure, remote modalities were initially introduced as an ad hoc temporary measure. However, the context has required protracted use. We work to adapt the delivery of our crucial PSS service to still be able to ensure reach and results. For this, we took a multi-pronged approach, with key adaptations being our outreach approach. So typically the way this program was designed, outreach relied on a door-to-door -door methodology, where assessments were conducted with the adolescent and the caregiver and other household members to determine vulnerability and risk factors for inclusion. We're extremely concerned that a lack of field presence would negatively impact the number of participants that could be identified for engagement. To aid in offsetting this, we had increased reliance on community focal points to act as referral agents signposting people in the community they thought might be eligible, with our caseworkers still conducting remotely the assessment. Additionally, we continued to coordinate with other sector actors who had more continued field presence to also refer to us. Finally, we promoted services remotely through existing communication channels to promote self-referral, including through community committees. So we knew that the topics and the needs remained as relevant as ever, but it was impossible for us now to deliver this face-to-face. As such, we looked into how to transition to internet or telephone lines. This was extremely challenging, given that a number of adolescents relied on the phone of the head of household or lived in areas where internet coverage was not consistent. Lebanon also suffers from regular electricity cuts, and that meant there would be constant disturbances to sessions if the reliance was only on internet, and there would also be a risk of exclusion if a child or their household did not have internet. While using internet platforms like Zoom would have allowed greater group size, we had to oftentimes use a multi-person telephone call instead which permitted far smaller groups, but it did ensure that all persons identified for the program were able to take part. Curriculum change. While the goals remained relevant when compared to the protection needs and concerns, what was challenging was the length of the sessions that used to be delivered in person in a certain time frame and to meet certain objectives. As such, we adjusted the delivery of the curriculum messaging. 
with some still being delivered in smaller group sizes on the phone or through internet platforms, but for a shorter time period, coupled with the delivery of workbooks that could be completed at home outside of sessions. Depending on the age of the child, we also delivered activities that could be worked on together with caregivers. We were able to deliver the workbooks either electronically where preferenced and possible, or through delivery to households directly where access permitted. Our meal tools. So we also realized that the tools we were using to gauge beneficiary feedback and the impact of the programming would also need to be adjusted to account for the change in modality. As a result, Neil and CP teams worked closely together to both ensure that the necessary information could be captured safely and remotely, while also not concealing any positive or negative findings that could inform future programming. From June 2020, the DRC Neil team was coordinating with DRC's child protection teams to receive the attendance sheets of beneficiaries receiving remote PSS and conducting a survey with a sample of beneficiaries from each list on a rolling basis. This rolling basis allowed us to make changes as programming continued, rather than waiting until the end of the implementation period or to hope that the remote working might be shorter or more temporary. So overall, the findings from this approach were positive in achieving the goals of improving knowledge and attitudes and affecting positive behavioural change. 98% of participants felt that the provided remote PSS was effective in delivering useful information that helped them in their everyday lives. This was mainly around COVID-19, identifying child marriage risks and harm, communicating with children, children's rights and different types of violence. As such, 99% of participants would recommend the remote PSS to their family and friends. The results also revealed that 94% of participants noticed changes in their behaviour since or throughout participation in the PSS activities. This again confirms the effectiveness of the adaptation. Caregivers listed the following as behavioural change, better communication with children, dedicating some time to themselves, being more understanding, feeling positive and confident, and feeling less nervous and depressed. Children also notice some changes in their behavior, such as having more confidence, improving their communication with their family and friends, becoming closer to family and friends, knowing how to deal with people, having improved decision-making and cooperation, and feeling less nervous. Both children and caregivers reported that the sessions increased their knowledge on different topics in their lives and helped them to take care of themselves. The main takeaways from going through this process that we had were uh, to focus on coordination. So we worked in coordination with other child protection actors to establish a community of practice and to harmonize approaches and advocacy. This was particularly relevant when needing to discuss flexibility around communication lines with donors whose grants are already partway through operating, for example, and to be able to share certain materials where appropriate with other child protection actors. Furthermore, coordination with other sector actors in areas of implementation who had more consistent field access, uh, such as WASH or basic assistance, meant that we were able to both deliver the hard copies of the learning materials through them when we had access restrictions and were able to leverage this coordination for referrals. Uh, we continuously needed to develop innovative ways to identify persons of risk remotely as we need to systematically improve and advance communications with beneficiaries and regularly reconfirm the best way to reach them, including in cases where they lose connection or cannot access their phone. We also need to provide beneficiaries with specific support to cover costs associated with remote activities, such as data bundles, devices, etc. And these should be integrated in program costs by donors and service providers. Further, we need to continue to adapt materials to ensure suitability to different audience groups, including youth, women, persons with various disabilities, older persons, and those who are illiterate, in order to also maintain beneficiaries' interest. And further to that point, beneficiary involvement. It was highly necessary that the mode of service delivery is fully informed by the beneficiaries. Um, we'd often read and hear so many wonderful examples of tech solutions or cash transfer uh, for data programs. However, we would also hear directly from our beneficiaries and community focal points firsthand that these solutions were not suitable. Uh, this was particularly relevant for people living in informal uh, and collective settlements. And flexibility. So not to take a one size fits all approach. For some individuals and groups, internet could be used, for others it would need to be phone calls. As the lockdowns were also rolling in Lebanon, we returned to in-person delivery when possible and prioritised and therefore needed to be able to switch quickly between the two modalities. Um, and this was also highly dependent on the geographic region and the beneficiary needs. We also found uh, it very, very necessary to ensure regular contact and adequate support to our community focal points who are often volunteers uh, during this unprecedented time. Our reliance on these focal points was invaluable in order to achieve the objectives of our program. So we had some unexpected positive outcomes that will frame our programming in the future. 
so we found that the shift in modalities helped with increased engagement of certain groups, including women and specifically female headed households who were sometimes less likely to participate in activities outside of their home due to traditional roles and gender norms. Beyond movement restrictions related to lockdowns and roadblocks, remote modalities were used to circumvent other types of mobility constraints and travel restrictions that were impacting persons of concern, including challenges related to movement restrictions based on the cost of transport or lack of valid residency and fear of arrest for refugees, as well as barriers for some persons with disabilities, especially those with mobility impairments and or medical conditions. The remote modality also proved beneficial for supporting beneficiaries and community members to overcome taboos associated with mental health and psychosocial needs by encouraging them to reach out more spontaneously for psychosocial support, as well as to speak more freely about their situation and concerns during remote sessions than they would in face-to-face -face interactions. The priority for our programming will be to return to in-person delivery as the program was originally designed. However, given the lessons learned and that remote PSS was effective in delivering the information needed and changing the behavior of beneficiaries in a positive way, and since beneficiaries were satisfied with its modality and found little challenges with it, uh, which has many positive budgetary considerations, of course, we will also be recommending to sustain elements of this modality beyond COVID-19 when hopefully our full humanitarian activities are resumed. Thank you very much. Bryony, we're so grateful that you're with us today and thank you for sharing these great insights. It was really interesting to hear about how previously hard to reach community members, such as women and adolescent girls and people with mobility constraints, were better, were better able to reach programming with the shift to um, phone calls and virtual programming. Um, I will now hand the metaphorical microphone over to Mace and Lisa. Clowns Without Borders um, is dedicated to sharing emotional relief, laughter and play with children and communities in crisis around the world. And how do we do that? We usually do that through performances, clown and circus performances to children and communities, uh, and also through giving um, workshops uh, to them uh, firsthand to children and adolescents and their caregivers, but also through training um, of social workers and facilitators who are uh, meeting and working with children on a daily basis. In 2019, uh, we started a collaboration with Plan International to support uh, the de development of life skills and parenting package. Uh, and for us from Clans That Borders, our role was to contribute with um, the creative uh, content uh, and to make the training more interactive. And we ended up in um, developing a training in creative facilitation and that Clans That Borders would roll out this training and plan would roll out the life skills um, package training, the curriculum training, and we will start um, and then plan with uh, continue uh, with the training. And the idea was to roll that out in, to start with three countries in the Lake Chad region, Nigeria, Niger, and Cameroon, uh, physical uh, trainings uh, based on, yeah, that there will be uh, travels and physical meetings and play and laughter sessions uh, in person. But then COVID came, and what happened? What happened then is that uh, we could not implement the trainings to roll out as planned. And we had to take another thought about it. And we were so excited, yeah, despite the situation and the pandemic, because in Clans That Borders, we do take playfulness seriously. And we like new challenges in, in which we have to be creative. So what we did is that uh, we took all the materials that we created and then reworked a new concept for a digital training. And we have a manual and supporting videos that could support that. And the training was built to be uh, done uh, in an online sessions in which Clans That Borders facilitators um, uh, give online sessions to facilitators in countries, uh, but then followed with offline sessions in which the facilitators in country uh, would um, continue the training uh, and they have uh, leaders in place. Uh, we have teamed up with um, our focal points, the co-facilitators from Plan International in the country who led the offline training simply. We ended up in implementing this uh, training in 12 countries instead of uh, three countries, um, reaching out to more than 500 
facilitators and also community volunteers. Um, the training that we implemented uh, with a group of facilitators was cascaded and more um, community volunteers were involved and together they uh, worked with the adolescents. And what was interesting here to see that, to say that in each country, in those 12 countries, there were different circumstances and different ways and different um, traveling uh, restrictions and, um, and so on. So what we did was to take the context of each country and to hear from the facilitators how they work. Uh, most of the countries were having some challenges either, either like WhatsApp groups, communications, or uh, physical meetings, but having, yeah, physical distancing and so on. And the whole training was adapted to the context that was in the country. I will pass it now to Lisa uh, to take us deeper into the training um, in the case of Nigeria. Hi, everyone. This is Lisa, um, gender-based violence officer from Nigeria who supported um, the Clowns Without Borders training. So I would like to be speaking on uh, what Mays already mentioned, the adaptation of the creative facilitation in COVID-19 context. Okay, so due to COVID-19 restrictions, like Mays earlier said, the Clowns Without Borders team was not able to uh, make it to Nigeria to have a face-to-face -face training. So we had participants who are project team members from different sectors that implement life skill sessions in their programming from education, protection and livelihood who were implementing in the base states of uh, Northeast Nigeria, Borno, Adamawa and Yobi. So what we are able to do since we had in-country movements, we converged at Abuja, which was a central point for all participants. And then we had a three-day training with the Clowns Without Borders team. So the team, the Clowns Without Borders team in the morning facilitated the trainings uh, on the online sessions. And in the afternoon, the focal points coordinated uh, afternoon sessions. So what we practically did was to put in learnings from the um, online sessions into our practice sessions in the afternoon. So where we are also designing and preparing practical sessions for adolescents uh, using the experiences uh, learned. We had several experiences after the training, which are quite interesting to share. So we had many participants um, we had reflections from many participants. And then uh, some participants had reflections like um, on the importance, learnings on the importance of play. Um, some other participants felt happy that uh, they were able to contribute in putting a smile on the faces of adolescents in crisis settings. Also overall, we have uh, reflections that also say that the privilege of applying this technique to work was a, a reflection that the participant shared. Personally, as an individual, I think it has made me uh, have a different approach to work in the sense that it has made me uh, seriously playful, um, which has also helped my, my activities, my facilitation right back with the adolescents. Okay. So the outcome of the training uh, recorded uh, impact both on the project participants and the facilitators. And most interestingly is also a feedback from the parents. So the uh, parents also were happy to share reflection from different sessions with the parents, showed that they were also happy to play and laugh. And they were saying they thought that playing was only for children, but they're happy that um, they carried along in all the creative facilities, uh, facilitation activities, the games and uh, the games and exercises from the play and laughter manual. So a facilitator also restated that work is now on phone. And personally, for me, uh, my own personal reflections from the training also, like I earlier said, helped me to be seriously playful, but also an opportunity also for me to get relief for, for some stress when I'm also facilitating these sessions myself. Okay, and thank you. That will be all from me. Thank you both so much, Mace and Lisa, for sharing this example. We'll now move on to the Q&A section. Um, I'd like to start with a question for all presenters. Um, will you continue any of your adaptations after restrictions are lifted? Um, I'll go to Bryony first. So will DRC keep any of these new adaptations in Lebanon? 
So as briefly mentioned um, at the end of my presentation there, we have found it quite useful in being able to reach people who might not be able to access the centres where we typically run this activity. Um, at the moment in Lebanon, we're facing both COVID and an economic crisis, which is having uh, an impact on the fuel accessibility in the country as well. So we are seeing more and more people not being able to afford to travel. Um, so we'll be able to continue to deliver either the full curriculum or at least parts of it for people for this reason. Um, and then also for people um, who may have other uh, restrictions on their mobility, um, including people who may have caregiver responsibilities within the home that we're restricting them being able to access the centres as well, particularly given that one of the topics we aim to cover it relates to child marriage and sometimes these uh, girls and boys are often caregivers as well. Um, so we do find that it will be, there'll be a number of elements that we will be looking to, to continue as well beyond the COVID-19 crisis for sure. Thank you, Ryan. And Mace and Lisa, do you think that you'll be continuing any of these adaptations when restrictions are lifted? Yes, uh, it's a tricky question because we do believe in the personal human meeting. So much happens when it's real a uh, human meeting. So having this said, I would say that we would continue. And um, I cannot deny that um, the pandemic has uh, made our relationships with partners way stronger. Um, the communication and the um, length of the partnership is way longer. And that's definitely something that we would love to keep. Um, also, I would say that this also gave us a jump because we had internally decided before that we want to digitalize um, our materials and pedagogical programs and so on. So this pandemic gave us a jump to 2025 already because we had before the pandemic planned okay, we'll do that towards the end of 2025, we will be ready, but we're already almost there. So I think that we cannot deny this. I still believe that in the personal human meeting, a lot can happen. And I believe that we all uh, miss that, but we would definitely take all the good things from this period and see how we can make some kind of combination of both simply. And Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, what about um, with PLAN in Nigeria? Will you still continue some of these adaptations? Yeah, we, we hope to uh, continue with these adaptations as uh, it saves uh, costs and then also uh, travel and a lot of stress. But of course, when things are much better, we can would also appreciate one or two face-to-face -face meetings. Thank you. Um, my next question is also for Clowns Without Borders. Do you experience any reluctance among adults to engage in such creative methodologies? Um, and if so, how do you get around that? Yes. Uh, and to answer, yes, in the beginning, but then all, like after all evaluations that we've done, all people um, mentioned, all participants, they mentioned that this was something that I really did not expect. I did not have this expectation, I was so reluctant and I was like, what am I getting myself into? And then towards the end, I can't believe that I did that and I would definitely do it again and even invite others to do it. So it's, yeah, uh, we face that and I'm really happy that, yeah, uh, people do change <laughs> after one session. Yes. That's very interesting. Um, so my next question is, Brian, is how did young people respond to these adaptations and was there any impact on their level of engagement compared to pre-COVID? Yeah, it was um, definitely something that we were trying to, to assess and manage. Um, so we did expect that there would be a lower level of like commitment and attendance, just given the fact, um, as was mentioned before, that sort of social element um, and of face-to-face -face was missing. But actually we found because, as I'm sure we're all aware of, being uh, locked up and restricted from a lot of other activities, this was actually something that the adolescents themselves were quite looking forward to. It gave the days a bit of structure, but it also was seen as uh, a bit of recreation as well. And I think having, um, for these sort of younger adolescents, having the workbooks to work on at home um, was really well received as well. Um, and by the caregivers as like something that they could do, just something to sort of 
somehow pass the time as well. Um, so it was quite well received. Um, and then going back to, to before we touched on, it was more well received by certain groups of adolescents as well. So particularly by um, groups of adolescents who maybe previously had been somewhat excluded from some of the more mainstream activities based on um, certain um, abilities to, to move around or to learn um, at the same pace as peers. This gave a bit more of like sort of self-guided approach to picking up the topics and feeding back directly um, that maybe people who didn't have the confidence to stand up in front of a group uh, to do before as well. Um, so we did find, and particularly as the lockdown periods went on and were more and more extended, that um, it, yeah, the, the, the interest to participate increased. I do have another follow-up question for you, Bryony, in that I know one of the major concerns was around online risks for children or cyberbullying, and I was just wondering if the team encountered any of that or like what were your mitigation measures to, to either prevent or to respond to those instances if, that, if they did occur? We were very, very also hyper aware of this issue. Um, and so we did promote a lot through our sort of um, hotline messaging that was going out consistently throughout COVID as well in terms of PSEA um, and how to access support and services. In, in terms of messaging to um, communities about all of these lines was also promotion to adolescents themselves and to caregivers about the risks of um, online harassment and bullying. Within our sessions, we didn't particularly have it. And largely that was because the majority of our sessions didn't rely so much on the internet. We were using a lot more of the group telephone calls. So that was, it had positives and negatives. Um, and one of the negatives was obviously less of an ability to interact through multiple forums, but it did also eliminate some of the bilateral conversations, but also eliminated some of that risk. Um, but it is something here in Lebanon that we've been um, looking at, not just at a DRC level, but at you know a sector level in terms of, we do know that a lot of the benefits of the remote modalities of moving things online will continue to be um, prioritized for both the, the PSS um, and life skills, but also for education actors. So it's definitely an area that's getting more and more attention as well as something to watch out for. Amazing. That's really, I mean, this is all super interesting and super fascinating. I think for the, the last question, and it's less so a question, but more of a, of a, a request, is I'd love to hear from um, each presenter what's one key recommendation for really strong life skills programming during COVID-19. Um, I'll hand it over to Lisa and Mace first. Well, th this is a really tricky and interesting question. Well, I would say maybe this, um, this more human interaction that we have to appreciate that and to give it, uh, yeah, all the energy simply. Uh, and also when we have the time to meet others, to, to keep distance and to try also to play and to have this interaction as much as possible. I would not say that there are so many negative things. There are also so many positive things and to learn from them and to see how we can take those challenges and try to see the positive things in that. Um, as I mentioned, like you see, you still can see some opportunities in those small challenges and to focus on that. And then afterwards to be proud of it and yeah, reward yourself <laughs> simply. I don't know, Lisa, it's, yeah, I think I took this question also on a personal level. So yes, <laughs> I'll pass it to you, Lisa. One strong recommendation I'll have for anyone facilitating life skills in COVID-19 is um, for the person to be seriously playful. Uh, that is also part of self-care and then having your own self supported by yourself psychologically or psychosocially. So that's very important to keep that in mind and that the learnings, uh, the sessions are not just for the adolescents, but we ourselves can pick lessons out of it. So that would be a strong recommendation for any facilitator to see it as a shared learning and not like an instructor tutor process. Thank you. Ryan, you would be one, your one piece of advice. <laughs> 
Um, I think for me, it's to definitely any adaptations that are being made um, and or that need to continue to be made is really to take um, some of the, the guidance and leadership from the actual communities that are being served by the programming themselves. I think that's really so great that we can have the opportunity to share experiences across countries and across regions um, and to really before implementing and while well during implementing, just ensuring that that feedback is always there so that the, it can be like purely contextualized to, to the communities being served so that it does promote the maximum amount of engagement um, and so that the, the messaging and the delivery can be the best understood and, and have the, yeah, the longest uh, sort of impact. That's great um, advice. And I feel like that is one of the really key findings or one of the key things that we have learned during COVID-19 is just how important it is to engage with and, and work with the communities that we're, we're trying to support and you know, really build on their knowledge and expertise. As we come to a closing of our time together, we would like to extend our thanks to our wonderful panel of presenters, to all of you for um, joining us today, to the Alliance to the B and to BHA for their support. Um, from all of us at the Alliance, thank you and goodbye.